my class is it's self-paced uh, or flex-paced, as, as I'll now start calling it. And um, every time an assignment is completed, the learner will show it to me. And I will learn, this could be an investigation out of the book, for example, or a problem set. I'm a math teacher for the most part, so most of my uh, frame of reference has to do with mathematics. So my procedure is the student shows me the assignments and their work. I take a look at it. I look, is it complete? Is it well done? Did some effort go into it? I kind of spot check a couple of the answers. I may recognize right away that, up oh, number five, everybody's getting that one wrong, and there's a reason for it. Why don't you go back and just double check number five really quick, more time. Or I can look at it, and it looks like it's a pretty good effort, and I say, okay, you're clear to check it. And I have a big box full of answer keys in my room. The students, and they're at a special table that is used for nothing but checking their own work. The, student, the learner will go sit there, they'll get out the appropriate answer key, and they will take a look at it, compare the answer key with what they have. If the answer's right, they put a check on it. If it's wrong, they put an X. Every single question has a mark put on it. Then they come back and show it to me again after they're done checking it. And I take a look at it. I kind of count up the checks and the Xs. If they've only got one or two wrong out of maybe 10 or 15 questions, that's pretty good. They've largely met the objectives of that lesson. Uh, if they get five or six wrong, not quite there yet. We might have a short discussion about the problems that they missed, and I will ask them to fix those, do them again, until they get to the point where only one or two or none are wrong on that assignment. So we're looking for mastery here. We're not looking for going through the motions, filling in the blanks, getting some kind of an answer and turning it in. No, they've got to be right, mostly, okay? And they check that themselves. Um, we have uh, quiz and exam corrections where the student actually goes over the exam with me or the quiz. And that's for their benefit, not mine. I already know what the grade is, okay? So they need to actually look at the ones they missed and understand if they're where they went wrong and try to fix them. So the next time they see something like that, they won't get it wrong. That's uh, self-assessment. And of course, good teachers are always walking around the room, seeing how things are going. You know, in the ideal classroom, you'd have three students sitting in a seat in an empty chair, three filled empty, three filled empty. What's that empty one for? It's for you when the time comes that you can sit right down with them. That's not always possible. I do have some empty seats around the room somewhere that I can sit down. But I had an idea that I came up with uh, for next year. I think I'm going to get a small camp stool, you know, one of those foldable ones. It's very lightweight. I'm just going to kind of carry it under my arm. And when it's time to sit down next to a group, I'm just going to pop it open and sit down and say, hey, how's it going? What's going on? What are you working on? How's your day going? What do you think of this? Did the video work? You know, what can I do to make it better? Done there, pop this up and then kind of wander around to the next place I needed and then, and then put it out again. So I'm going to try that next year. It's important to kind of get down to their level so you're not up here and they're down there, you know. So, uh, informal discussion. Have a dedicated space in the room for intensive, personalized learning to take place. I've got one in my room. It's called the intensity table. There's actually a red sign on it that says intensity table. And that's for intensive, one-on-one, -on -one personalized instruction. It could last five minutes. It could last 20. And the kids are encouraged to come up and just sit there. They don't have to raise their hand and say, I need help or something like that. They, they do that too. But ideally in the morning, after we get done with our initial warm-ups or you know, taking attendance and all that kind of thing, I look over, if there's somebody sitting at the intensity table, they're sending me a message. And that message is, I have tried hard, but I need some help. And so I will go sit down with them. Sometimes there's two or three. We can be doing different things at the same time. And we will stay at the intensity table if they have, can show me their notes, if they have tried it, they can show me some initial attempt at their effort, then I am there to give them all the help that they need, direct instruction, explanations. Now I'll have to tell you that if they sit there and they've got no notes, if they can't show that they've attempted anything on their own, I'm a lot <coughs> less likely to give that student some help as opposed to the one that has showed me they've done their part. Okay? If you don't instill in them the idea that they've got to do their part first, they'll never start doing their part. They're just going to constantly rely on you to explain everything to them. And that's not what we're trying to achieve in education today. We're trying to develop self-directed learners who are willing to put forth some effort and then get some help from you. So the intensity table or something like it, I have found to be really helpful. And uh, I didn't have it at first. Okay, it was some, an idea that I implemented later when I realized that I needed something else to make this work. 
and it has been real successful, the intensity table, okay? Now there's the other directed assessment, other, that's you, that's us, and we do things both summatively and formatively. The summative part is mostly what's recorded in the grade book. I use automated quizzes. Automated quizzes are critical because you, if you do paper quizzes and if you're doing mastery and you have to achieve a certain level of achievement, you cannot, I tried it at first. I didn't have automated quizzes. 50% of my class time was spent grading quizzes like mad so that I could give the kids some feedback so that they would know whether they were qualified to continue or not. That will not work. Those quizzes are little snapshots. They've got to be uh, automated in some way. Now, I know one of the other instructors said that they have quizzes, but they're only one question long or something like that. That would probably work. But mine are 10 or 15 or 20, and a little bit more comprehensive. And they were automatically graded. The kids got instant feedback on those. Those were a good idea, I think. I also use hand-graded exams, which include both multiple choice and constructed response, explain your answer, show your work, that kind of thing. And in some cases, alternative assessments are fine, and we've heard a lot about that if the, uh, the student says, you know, can I just write down everything I know about how to add, multiply, subtract, and divide fractions and show that to you? And my answer to that would be yes, and I would see what they wrote down. I might put a multiplication of fractions problem on the board, a division, an addition, a subtraction, make one really, really hard, and uh, see, show me what you can do on those. And then while I'm going around the room doing my other thing, maybe five or 10, 15 minutes later, they would be done and I would see what they got on the board. And if it met the requirement that they demonstrated they can add, multiply, subtract, and divide fractions, then they met the minimum requirement. And that's not a traditional test, but it's not about testing, it's about learning, right? So we're trying to get to. And then if there's the formative side of things. I use whiteboards in my class. Kids love those. Uh, I use them as a warm up sometimes, five to 10 minutes. And I you get uh, some, a good idea of who's copying off of everybody else, who doesn't know how to do the problem, who is leading the other students, you know, in solving the problems. You get a lot of insight that way. It's not for a grade. It's a peek into their minds to see who's getting it and who isn't. And every once in a while I throw in, you know, usually the question is, what, show me the prime factorization of 720. And I don't know about you, but a lot of kids love to make those trees and do prime factorization. They love that. <coughs> Uh, once in a while, it's uh, name five mammals. You've got 10 seconds. Quick, go. <laughs> Just to mix it up a little bit and keep things interesting, and they like that too. Right? Personalized quiz reviews, that happens at the intensity table where they get their computer out. And uh, Mr. McIntosh, can you go over this quiz with me? I, I need to get a 75 on it. I only got a 60 on it. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And we will sit down and literally go over the exact quiz, clear up their misconceptions, and if we're good to go, they can take the quiz immediately right again right there on the spot often after we do that and pass it. Personalized exam reviews are the same way except those on, are on paper. Often it only takes about five minutes you know, to look at a problem, several problems, and, and point out their errors or misconceptions. You can jot down another problem similar to the one really quickly on the piece of paper after you tell them a little bit about it and ask them to come back in five minutes, see if they get it now. Okay. Go walk around, that's where my camp stool is gonna come in handy next year. And again, there's non-traditional formative assessments, and I have an idea for one of those I'll show you shortly. I have found pre- and post-tests to be invaluable, especially in switching over to the flipped model. There's not a lot of data out there about whether it works or not. Do you achieve the same results as you would, or are your results better? That's what we're trying for, is better results. And we want to know if kids are learning. And so by looking at a pre-test, and scoring it on a scale of 0 to 100 and comparing it to a very similar post-test where the questions are very similar, often identical, but the numbers are changed around or they're slightly, you know, same concept, different question. Um, we can see and learn some interesting things. For one thing, the kids are often pleasantly surprised by the result. They may not think that they're learning, but so I've had very interesting experiences where the kids were skeptical about this system and you show them their post-test and their pre-test and it's like, wow, I'm learning something. And that, kind of changes the way they think when they see that. Uh, it also, if your results are good, which they should be, it shows parents that yes, this method works. It shows your administrators, gives them some data at least to think about, well, maybe this is worth a try after all. It is working. And it serves as a metric to analyze the effectiveness of your program. Uh, I kind of come from a background of when total quality control was like the big 
deal in the 80s and whatnot, you know, the old saying, which I still believe is true, is what can't be measured can't be improved. You have to have some way of measuring things to tell if, if you make a change, did it improve it or not? If you're not taking some kind of measurements, you're just kind of shooting in the dark and everything's floating around, you don't know if you're heading the right direction or the wrong direction. So you gotta be willing to change what you do and you gotta be willing to measure what you do so that you know when to change what you're doing if it's not working. And uh, demonstration of mastery. You know, I, I got a 45 on the pretest. I got a 87 on the post test. Well, I've met the requirement. Okay, you got to measure things. And I have some data to share with you now. These are some pre and post test results from a grade seven pre-algebra class. Uh, this was a, yeah, unit one in pre-algebra. On the pretest is on the left. The post test is on the right. These are box plots. The bottom. Whisker is the minimum, the top one was the maximum score, and the line through the middle was the median score for all of those, and then those are the, uh, the uh, quartiles surrounding the median. And in this particular case, this was unit one, very easy, earlier in the year, okay, somewhat familiar topics to most people, and uh, the pretest and the post-test results, there was a 22% difference in the means, okay? I also want to point out that, notice that the range was quite high on the pretest, but on the post-test, the range was much narrower Okay, so that was a decent result. But what about later on in the semester when the material was not quite so easy? This was proportions and ratios. A lot of seventh graders find that a fairly hard topic. Okay, and on this one, you can see the pretest results were quite low. Even way down here, this, this that, that kid got one out of 50 questions right on the pretest. Uh, some people do it fairly well, but a really good change on the post test and this is for all three of my pre-algebra classes combined each graph is made from somewhere between 60 and 80 data points okay are represented by each graph okay um, and I kind of like this here the median of the post test was higher than the highest grade achieved by anybody on the pretest that's pretty good 43 percent difference in the means between the pretest and the post test it's a good result and I subjected that to a student's t-test, um, and it's, there's almost no chance that that's by accident, okay? Yes? What kind of software do you use for this? I used a statistical analysis and graphing package called Kaleidograph. It's about 140, <laughs> yeah, Kaleidograph. I've been using it for many, many years, and I like it. So to get this data, I just had to enter the scores in two columns, choose box plot, and it does all the calculations and everything automatically for you, okay? Good software. All right, these are outliers right here, but not everybody, you know, wants to play the mastery game. You can try to get them to, and most of them do, but not everybody. What about algebra? Here's a similar analysis for a grade seven algebra class. These are fairly advanced students if they're taking algebra in the seventh grade. Pre-test on the left, post-test on the right. 36% growth, again, the same pattern of the narrowing of the range. Over here, a little bit later, linear relationships, 30% growth, a tremendous narrowing of the range. Okay? On average, you're looking at a number of these, somewhere between 25 and 45% is the growth that I generally see between the pretest and the post test. I wish I could say I had some data to compare with the traditional method on this. I don't, because um, I just started doing this analysis last year. And I have asked around for other teachers if you have some data from pre and post tests that you have, from different teaching methods that you use, I'd love to see it. Uh, love to see it. What's even more important when you have this pre test, post test data, you know, that's the average for big old groups of kids. What about on an individual level? That's even more powerful. If we look in here, this was a unit four pre algebra, pre and post test. I don't know if you can see it or not, but the ones next to the, the smiley faces next to him are the ones I'm going to point out. This student achieved a 37 on the pretest, 77 on the post test, 21 on the pretest, 83 on the post test. You know, that 30 to 40% gain is just an average. Some kids gain 60, 70% between the pretest and the post test. 48, 75, 27, 92. I like that one going from a 27% on the pretest to a 92 on the post test. 18 to, oh, didn't quite get there. Not everybody is willing to put forth the effort, and that's 
the kid that you need to spend more time with there. And you can see that by looking at your data. This kid's not progressing the way we want to. Didn't start out that good. Problem is, he never gets to the point where he can see how well he really does. Reluctant learner there, okay? 27, 92, that was a good one. 37, 92, these are good results. Yes? Did anyone go down? No. I had some that did not change, but there'd be like one out of 100. One or, one or two out of 100 would show no growth. I'm pretty sure that's the same kid that would show no growth in any class or any system, but don't know for sure. So that's obviously the kind of information you want to share with the individual student's parents when you have that kind of information, okay? Can't do it unless you're collecting the data, though, so I strongly suggest that you collect some kind of data. These automated quizzes uh, that I talked about are good because they're a snapshot. I put two to five per unit, roughly, depending on how big the unit is. I limit the initial attempt to three or four so that the kid can't just decide they're going to bang on these things until they hit a 75, you know? They're uh, randomized, so there's very little chance that the same quiz will come up twice. Um, and I require a minimum mastery grade. In my case, it's 75. I've heard different numbers kicked around at the conference, 70, 80, something like that. Personally, I don't consider 75 mastery, you know, because mastery implies little or no mistakes ever. If you're a master of kung fu, you don't get beat, right? You don't make a mistake, all right? These are more like adequacy grades. Like, Mastery, what, that's 95, 98%. That's mastery. We're not there yet. We've got to start somewhere. I think 75 is a reasonable starting point, okay? And as I said, on the formative side, we go over the quizzes on an individual basis, and lots of teaching goes on as you're going over quizzes and assignments with individual kids. Let me just show you really quick. I'm going to pop into my Moodle site and show you how the quizzes are incorporated in my course plan. This is what my Moodle page for algebra looks like. If we scroll down at a typical course sequence, my first unit was analyzing data. Looks like we can see that okay. So I have a note section where students contribute their own volunteer notes. That was only partially successful. But I have these benchmarks along the way. Dot plots and bar graphs was the first one. Five number summaries and box plots. Stem and leaf plots was the second one down here. And here's the instructional videos and podcasts. There's the first assignment. Here's a real world example I found of how you would apply this topic. They can go look and see how scientists are using dot plots. A worksheet, the next assignment. We keep going all the way down until we're done talking about dot plots, bar graphs, measures of center, and it's time to take the first quiz, and it's an online quiz right there that they take it. My whole sequence is kind of set up very similar to that. They get down to the end, and they take the post-test, which is on paper. <coughs> okay? So that's how I incorporate the quizzes in sort of little snapshots along the way, pre-test at the beginning, post-test at the end. Now on those automated quizzes, I use Moodle, and it does a lot of data analysis for me. I can look in there at a particular quiz, and I can kind of see what the general trend is. This was for three pre-algebra classes. Each one's in a different color. 75 is somewhere right around in here, and I can see that most of the kids are achieving that 75% level. A few aren't. Over time, when this first starts out, the, the peak of this graph is somewhere over here. But as time goes by, remember they're allowed to retake it, the peak of the graph shifts to the right. So that's something you can monitor to make sure that over time, more and more scores are being shoved into the higher bins. Okay, so you kind of monitor how the quiz results are going that way using Moodle. Another thing that is more on the personal side of things, you know, you get the phone call of Mr. McIntosh, I want to come in and talk to you. My kid says not learning anything in your class. 
So uh, one thing that I found very helpful is to actually monitor how many visits they make to my ALEC site. We call it ALEC in our district, to my Moodle site. And it's got this analysis built into it as well. And the top one is a graph of the hit count pattern on my Moodle site of a successful student compared to the hit count pattern of that one that called me on the phone wondering why their kid isn't learning anything, okay? And the answer is because your child is not following my instructions about how to be successful in this class, not visiting the course site, seeing what needs to be done, not knowing what to do on a daily basis, not following my instructions. This uh, one here, you can even see that they don't work much on weekends. There's one week, week, and then there's a break, and then there's a, another hump of work. So this person has a kind of a plan. They kind of do a bunch of work now, and then they take it, and then a bunch of work then, and then a bunch of work then. Visiting the site all the time to see what's going on. Where are they in my sequence? What do I got to do next? Making a plan. No planning. No success. Okay? That's more on the monitoring side, on an individual basis. Another thing I've done is I've just asked the kids, how's it going? What do you think of this method? Is it working for you? And uh, I was pretty nervous about this one at first. This was, we were into about a couple of months of uh, the program. I just handed each one an index card and say, please put on there a one to 10, how this is working for you. You know, they're, 12, they're 11 and 12 year olds. That's, may, they may not have been rating how well it's working. They may be rating how well they liked me or something like that, you know, who knows. I asked them, don't do that. It's not about me. It's how well is this working for you? One, it's the worst thing I've ever had to 10 being this is the most fantastic thing I've ever had. And I was relatively pleasantly surprised with the results that for the most part, uh, most kids are like, you know, five, they're willing to give it a chance. You know, willing, some of them loved it, willing to give it a chance. Okay, one interesting pattern I saw from this was in the shape of these curves. The red is algebra and the blue is pre-algebra. So on the red curve, we see, well, there's nobody that completely gave it a one. And there was kind of a hump at around eight, which was not bad, but then it dropped precipitously, and nobody loved it. So nobody completely despised it. Nobody totally loved it. These are the advanced kids, seventh grade algebra students. And I think this is just a hypothesis on my part that they don't like the fact that somebody was just not showing them what to do, explaining how to do it, because they got great memories. They're good at remembering things. They can write stuff down and duplicate examples. Okay, so this was not their perfect element. I have to train them out of that. Unlike the pre-algebra kids, the shape of their curve is, you know, your reluctant learners down here, gosh, man, this is making me think too much. I despise this method, as opposed to the ones that, well, I love school, and this is great because I can go at my own pace, and I don't have to wait on other people, and I can learn as much as I want. So the pre-algebra kids seem to have more open mind about this process than the more advanced kids. That's just a hypothesis, though. Yet another thing, a lot of schools have their own ways of assessing learning. We use this thing called a Scantron test at our school. It's an automated online test that kids take three times a year, roughly. And this is a particular student that has been taking this test in our district since the fourth grade. Hers is the green line, our district average on the same assessment is the dotted line above it. This kid has struggled. Uh, she came into the seventh grade math, barely knowing, in my opinion, you know, fifth grade math for the most part, struggled with some ideas. Always behind, you know, showing a little bit of growth. But towards the end of the year, of this, her seventh grade year, suddenly we detected this large increase in what she was able to demonstrate on this test. You may have some other ones that you do. We used to do one called tungsten, very same idea. This was Scantron. And did this learner complete the entire course sequence for me? No, perennially behind, okay? Maybe completed 60% of it, I'd say, by the end of the year. But you know what? According to this, she got more out of my math class this year being asked to only do 60% of it well, as opposed to being jammed through the system at the same pace, being required to cover the material with everybody else, okay? So I was pretty pleased with this result. Yes, this is a good result. Not every student had this result. It's more likely that if their green line was far above the district average, they would not likely see so much growth. I saw some of them did, some of them stayed the same. Some kids, uh, you know, varied. There's about 
there's quite a bit of variability in the results of this test. Some days they feel like taking it, some days they don't, you know, and that really affects the results as well. Um, but this is the kind of re result you want to share with that individual child's parents when you have it, okay? I mentioned uh, non-traditional formative assessments, and this is one that I have found very interesting, and that's give a kid a puzzle, okay? Um, you may have noticed, as well as I have, that lots of kids, it probably even happens in high school or even in college, are reluctant to spend a lot of time on something that they can't figure out. If they can't figure it out in two minutes, it's just not worth figuring out, and I'm going to go on to something else, okay? And you can really kind of get some insight into an individual learner's mind by giving them a little puzzle, seeing if they like it or not, seeing how long they can stick with it and work on it. Uh, unfortunately, there's a large chunk of kids that will, and these are, you know, for this one here, you had to like get all the blocks on the outside a certain color and then the ones on the inside matching in a certain color. This one here is a cube that had to be nine pieces to be assembled into a cube. There's another one taken apart and put together a geodesic uh, sphere of some kind. And this one was working on a tangram puzzle. And uh, often, you know, the reluctant learner, they are the same one that will give up in 30 seconds on one of these. 30 seconds, literally. Uh, I have a different one. I can't get this one. <laughs> and I know from my personal experience, that one takes 30, an hour, an hour and a half to figure out of dedicated effort, of trying new things, new ideas, trying to get it to work, okay? You, do you have some kids that will spend an hour and a half on that puzzle? Yes, you do. And there's a real insight into the way the kids approach challenging problems by just giving them something simple like this. So this is what I call a real non-traditional formative assessment. It's meant to be fun, you know, it's not for a grade. Does the kid ask for the puzzle again the next day in homeroom? as opposed to the kid that doesn't ask again for the puzzle, you learn something about your, your students this way that you wouldn't learn any other way, I don't think. So giving them a puzzle is kind of a fun idea. So to sort of summarize, it's important to use a combination of both formative and summative methods. Require a minimum mastery score on the summative assessments. Allow retakes. Remember, on my automated quizzes, they're limited to three or four before they are not allowed to take it again until they come see me, so we can have a little chat. In some cases, an alternative assessment may be appropriate. And in order to back yourself up, to give yourself something to talk about with your administrator and parents who are skeptical, perhaps, collect some data and present it graphically to make it visually clear. And I like the pre-test, post-test method for that. And then, of course, Use whiteboards, clickers, personalized uh, quiz and exam reviews, surveys and puzzles, uh, or anything else that you can invent that nobody else has ever thought of before to see how things are going in your class and use them. And if you want to continue this discussion further, I have posted a discussion section on the flipped class Ning. And it was titled exactly the same as this presentation was titled. Please post some questions there and continue the discussion. You're more than welcome to email me at philip.mackintosh at asd20.org. That's my school address. Please follow me on Twitter uh, when I post some new information or have some uh, an epiphany or a new idea or a question. I'll pump it out on there. And uh, visit my blog if you like. I have some instructions on how to do certain things and uh, some musings on the flipped classroom and philosophy of education at mrmackintoshsays.org. So I'd like to open it up and uh, hear or discuss, you know, try to answer any questions you have or listen to your ideas. What, what uh, assessment and monitoring ideas have you used that uh, have worked? So there's some people in the room. You're more than welcome to join the conversation. If there's anybody online that wants to do that, then we're uh, available. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yes, sir. I have a question about your pre post test assessments. Right. Or, um, um, have you gone to the point where you've taken the things you did at the beginning of the year and found some way to sort out that, in, that kind of testing you're doing, you do like a final test, and see uh, how the results compare to the pre post test at that unit period? You mean a more comprehensive test that is not just based on a unit? Right. That would, so a more comprehensive test that would compare at the end of the year what they remembered from 
stuff all year long compared to what the results were the first part of the year? Uh, our district, uh, in algebra at least, has the thing called the common assessment. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did do that this year. Um, there's no pretest that goes along with that, though, right. which but would be kind of an interesting would be idea. The test of the units, say. If you yeah. could sort the questions. Maybe I take the average of those or something and then compare yeah. it to the overall post test. Yeah. Uh, we have the data, it hasn't been uh, crunched yet. Uh, that would be an interesting yeah. thing to look at. Very interesting to look at. Uh, the reason I ask is not because of what you're showing here, uh -huh. but one of the things I keep telling my wife that I think is really discouraging as a high school teacher is when I read the newspapers, when I list our politicians, and they obviously don't know what they're talking about. Like the guy the other day who was making a comparison, something that increased 2,000%, and then he gave the final number, and he obviously multiplied it by 2,000. <laughs> and I, I mean, that kind of stuff happens all the time. And I think, how can we make decisions at our national level? We don't even understand basic arithmetic. Right. Uh, and that's true of anything we're teaching. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of mastery learning seems to be can we see that it carries through further on and, and how effective that is? Well, ideally, we would hope that it sticks yeah. better. Right. Uh, one thing I did do uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, sort of informally, was I did give like a, a, a large comprehensive quiz to see what they remembered from the year before. And so if your idea has merit, which I believe it does, it would be interesting to give that assess that summative assessment, you know, the end of the year algebra exam, something similar to it at the beginning of the year, and then compare it to the end of the year. And I think that is a useful uh, instrument. Uh, I might try that. Might be some, yeah, some way to work yeah. that out. Thanks for the uh, suggestion on that. Anybody else? <coughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just lost it there. Okay. Do we have a question online? Uh -huh. I've been looking on Amazon and iBook for books on Moodle. I like user documentation. It appears that the latest version of Moodle is new, 2.0. Any recommendations? Well, I get all my Moodle information from clicking on the little information icons within Moodle. Show you one real quick. So when I'm in editing mode, every place you see a question mark inside of Moodle, and there's one right there. Moodle is full of these little question marks and all over it, and just about everything you need to do. So if you're on a step, God, I want to add a resource. What the heck does that mean? If you click on that question mark, it zooms you over to the moodle.org uh, support site, and you can read their documentation about that function. I find that quite helpful. Also, if you have a question about Moodle, a lot of them I have found answers to by literally Google searching the question and it takes you to informal Moodle discussion boards. It takes you to other school districts' Moodle discussions. It takes you to other people's blogs and websites where they have found fixes to that exact same problem you're trying to look for. So between just the standard old Google search and those question marks within Moodle, I believe those are your best bet for resources for learning how to use Moodle. Anything else? Yeah? There's a great free book called Using Moodle that you buy from Amazon or download free out of Moodle Docs. Okay. It's very helpful, and I have a link if somebody wants it. Someone just uh, online said there's a free book available on Amazon about uh, Moodle and provides the link on there. So well, if you're it's, on the it's $27 on Amazon, but it's oh. free to download it. Oh, 27 to purchase, free to download. Where's the download? Um, Whoever that person is, if you could perhaps go to the discussion section for this uh, seminar on the Ning, the Ning which is flippedclass.com you can get there and please post that link in there for other people to use I think that would be very helpful thank you any other questions yes sir I should I, I, it's kind of like a, you know, a flow of your class kind of, kind of question uh -huh. so you give a paper test is that all in like one day like is there a certain day you have to be done by the student that here's the test or uh, no uh, my first uh, try of doing this, it was pretty flexible. Um, I did, at the beginning of every unit, it would say estimated time of completion, three to four weeks. So to give the kids some sort of idea how long it should take them to do it. And uh, to be honest with you, you know, there are a few kids that cannot go anywhere near as fast as they have been asked to go during their entire educational career. And if they got behind by a month, a couple of them, you know, 
I didn't mind that. You know, I want to give that example of the one student that has been behind all this time and showed that great growth by doing a better job on less. You can't cram that kid through the system or they're just going to stay below that line forever. Okay. Uh, in the next season, though, I probably will tighten that up a little bit and be a little bit more strict on where you're how far you're supposed to get. I'm going to use the suggestion made by John and Aaron of putting an extra unit at the end of the first semester and an extra unit at the end of the second semester so that the goal looks farther away than it really is. So that you, man, I'm trying to get there, but I only got four-fifths of the way. Ta-da! That's as far as you're supposed to get. Okay, so. How's that work out for your grade life? Well, I think one of the best suggestions I've heard so far at the conference is, is that if at the end of the quarter you're supposed to do two units and you only got one and a half done, that for every half unit you get that you missed, you get docked a letter grade. And I thought about doing that last year, but I didn't lay the groundwork for it. I didn't tell the parents that that's what I was going to do, so I didn't do it. So I had some that only completed like five out of seven units. And they got a pretty good grade, you know, a B or something like that. Does that deserve a B? Probably not. Uh, so in the future, I think that just as long as you lay the groundwork and explain your plan, that it is okay to reduce a grade by a certain amount based on how much they did not accomplish. So I think that's a reasonable approach to that problem. Any other thoughts on that? Okay. Is there another question from online by chance? Okay. Yes, sir. Moodle itself, how hard is it to put up? I mean, if you have a server already, is it just? Um, you know, I'm pretty good at using Moodle uh, from the teacher perspective. I don't have any experience from the administration of Moodle side of things. Our district IT department installed it all and presented it to us as something that we could use. Um, I think uh, if you've ever built your own website and hosted it somewhere, all on your own, that you would have a fair shot at installing your own Moodle uh, system on a server somewhere. It has to be hosted by somebody, uh, but if you're comfortable with websites, and if uh, Moodle is written in a programming language called PHP for the most part, uh, if you have any experience with uh, Java or any other programming language a little bit, uh, I think you could probably make a pretty fair run at it on your own. But if you've never set up a website, I think the learning curve would be you know, very high to set up your own Moodle installation. Not impossible, but you know, it wouldn't be easy necessarily. Yes. There's, there's places that post it for right. individuals, and some of those are free. Right. So uh, I think uh, we, you were talking to me this yeah. morning, right? What was the name did, of the one site? Did you find it? I haven't. Didn't have a chance to look for it. I think it's key to learning. Key, key to, to school. school. Free, key to school. Is that what you're school? You know what I'm talking about? It's hosted in India. K e y t o school.com. Yeah. K-E-Y-T-O school.com. It's the first thing that comes up when you uh, Google free Moodle. Free Moodle. Oh, okay. I think there's others too. So there are some free ones out there. And so it's all hosted. You just have to learn how to use it, like you say, from that side. Right. An individual, I think they may even do all the school. I don't know. Any other questions? I was going to ask you that kaleidoscope or kaleidograph. kaleidograph yep. Is that a commercial software? Or it is. Or? It's $139 for educator, I believe. You get a site license for a, for five users for $112. i have been using it for over 10 years and keeping it updated. It's like it makes nice graphs. It sure does. It does a lot of uh, in built in statistical analysis, t tests, ANOVA, anything you need for any kind of reasonably complex scientific data analysis it's good for that kaleidograph the company's design science is the name of the company and that's available pc now yep both okay. pc and mac well, I, I used to use it way back in the day when they first started it yeah yeah then. how do you like it how did you well, like it i liked it, it back then because yeah. i thought it was so user friendly it is it's quite intuitive so i didn't realize they had a pc version of it now. yeah they've had one for a long time now it's good wow. available for both pc and mac Well, that's all I had for you today. I thank you so much for coming and attending. And again, 
please visit my blog or email me or the name and continue the discussion. Thank you very much. Yeah. I should 